Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending June 13th. First up, this was sent from my friend Chris P., also known as Darth Peachy on YouTube. YouTube has never looked better. This is a site called youtube.com forward slash test tube, and it gives you, I guess, things that you can try ahead of time is what it's about. It says, welcome to test tube, our ideas incubator test experimental features concocted by YouTube's mad scientist. And the one he talked to me about, there's two of them actually here, the redesigned YouTube player, but the one he talked to me about was YouTube has never looked better, the 4K part of YouTube uh, dealing with 4K videos and especially at 60 frames per second. Uh, I didn't try the 60 frames per second. Um, they say it's a way to test out and they give you a list of uh, playlist of our favorite 4K videos and I actually tried it out on my machine and it's not cutting edge at all. Mine's a middle of the line machine. I did upgrade to a cheap video card from Onboard Video. It's an i5 quad processor system with a um, 2 gig video card that was about, it was an NVIDIA card that cost me, I don't know, about 45 bucks. And it handled the 4K videos very well. That really surprised me. It was no problem loading, streaming, playing the videos. Uh, they played just as well as any of the 720p videos. So if you get a chance, check out. And as usual, all the links to everything will be down below in the description box. But I was really surprised. Now, the one problem I do have is my monitor only has a resolution of 960, so anything above 720, even 1080. I guess you could say technically 1080 would look um, slightly better than 720, but my monitor is just not capable of the uh, 4K resolution, so um, I wouldn't get any real better results. But just the fact to see that it would actually play and the video card and all my uh, processor and everything would actually handle 4K video rather surprised me with uh, not having a real power machine. And next up, this is from my friend Bob, 1954 Shadow. Space buoy may help protect power grid from sun's fury. I talked about SOHO before, the uh, solar observatory that's right now kind of giving us a little bit of space weather as far as the sun's solar flares and things like that. Well, that thing's been going on for 19 years now. It was only originally a, a two-year mission. It was a combined mission from the European Space Agency and NASA, and it's kind of like uh, been our weather predictor satellite about solar flares too, but now they specifically made a craft that is uh, up designed with the latest technology and specifically really, ex supposedly it's going to be really excellent at pinpointing the areas where we're going to get solar flares and where they're going to hit. And as a matter of fact, they could designate, okay, it's going to hit the east coast of the United States, maybe it's going to hit uh, England and northern Europe, stuff like that. But they've parked it in orbit. Uh, as of last week, it was parked in the L1 Lagrange orbit, about a million miles from Earth. Uh, that's a balanced place where it can actually stay put where we want it to stay. Um, that's kind of like an oversimplified way of saying what a Lagrange orbit is, but um, basically you can look it up if you want to know a little bit more. But what this is going to do now is it's going to give us sometimes between 15 minutes and up to an hour warning time if a solar storm is coming our way and we can actually do things to protect our satellites and our uh, power grid, things like that. We do have safety features in place, but we have to have some kind of early warning system to be able to know these things are going to be able to happen. So, And the accuracy of where it's going to happen on the Earth too. So. Um, yeah, they, they estimate, uh, if you've looked at history back in the uh, 1800s, there was a solar flare that really disrupted the telegraph system. And if uh, there are estimates of uh, if it was to happen, just uh, it's called the 1859 Carrington event. If it were to happen nowadays, that could cost us between $1 trillion and $2 trillion in damage and take from 4 to 10 years to recover from it if we got hit with that and no uh, warning and just had to take a full hit. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully this will be a pretty decent thing and we'll get some uh, weather. I'll, I'll put you other links to the uh, homepage of uh, NOAA. I'll put the link to that too. And then the Discover Deep Space Climate Observatory um, link to that uh, web page itself too. Uh, it's pretty interesting. A lot of uh, videos, a lot of, uh, a lot of really good reading if you're into space weather and want to track it. I mean, you can stay on the NOAA site and they'll, uh, they'll give you graphs about the uh, coronal mass ejections, the aurora, the sun's x-rays. They'll give you charts on what's the present uh, proton flux, the planetary K index, the x-ray flux. So you can just totally geek out on that if you want to learn more about space weather, especially to do anything to do with the sun. And next up, NASA test failure. Parachute didn't inflate during Mars experiment. Over Hawaii, they were doing another experiment. I talked about the one last year that happened. And basically, it seems like the same thing happened uh, this year. They uh, are testing out the parachute. They want to go up into the upper atmosphere where the 
Earth's atmosphere is about the same thickness as Mars and test out these parachutes for these high-speed landings with uh, heavy weights before they're going to send any kind of people or big huge cargo loads up there. They want to know they have a system to be able to slow it down and land it properly. Well, last year the parachute just basically tore to shreds, and the same thing happens on this one. You can see the video of it on here. They have the video right at the top. Same thing happened, too. As soon as they deployed the parachute, it just ripped to shreds. But it's a good thing. You want to have the failures now so that you can uh, decide. You know, you don't want that to happen by the time you get to Mars. You want this stuff well tested. And... Uh, this also gives you an idea whether it's even practical to do it this way or not. If they um, probably have another failure of a test, they could possibly even go on to another type of idea other than using this type of parachute system, maybe using something completely different or another type of material or another type of maybe a, a series of uh, parachutes or something like that. But uh, good that they're doing the testing now way, way ahead of time. And last up, um, I love these kind of learning apps like this too where you can... Uh, um, Find out what things are that you don't know what they are. In other words, you maybe you're walking through the woods and you see a, a bird or something like that. And uh, constantly, I'm no expert on birds. I'm like a beginner bird watcher, and I'll see a bird and I don't know what it is. They got this app called uh, Merlin Bird ID app, and you can put it on your phone either on uh, uh, iPhone. It's good for iPhone. It's good for Android. And just by asking uh, five questions about the bird you spotted. Um, based on the database and other bird watchers in your area, it can identify whatever bird. And it, it does it pretty accurately, too. I guess uh, 90%, it's got a 90% accuracy rate for the first uh, three birds that it tells you that's the po that you could have possibly seen. Um, they're also working on eventually, I guess they're going to have it as a, a web page and have it work that way, but right now it's just strictly a phone app. But uh, that's kind of cool. I love these kind of learning apps. I wish they would make them more. This right now is just for Canada and North America, so... Um, the rest of you will have to have to wait, and I hope they do work on something that's uh, worldwide. But I would actually like to see this too for like bugs, spiders, all kinds of creatures. You know, different snakes, uh, pretty much any kind of animal that you spot or something like this. If if it can work for birds and be pretty well, and and it draws on uh, the learning curve from all the other people that use the app. I guess the the app learns and gets better as more people put more data into it. Um, it gets more and more accurate. So. It says it draws upon 70 million observations from the eBird Citizen Science Project. It customizes your list of the species you're most likely to have seen at your location and time of year. Browse more than 2,000 stunning images. It also has 1,000 audio recordings of the birds, too. So if you don't get a good look at the bird, you could even reference based on the audio recordings, too, and maybe find out what kind of bird you uh, was near your area that you uh, couldn't get a really good look at. So that's kind of cool. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Thank you, everybody that contributed, and be sure, if you're on Facebook, to check out the Dumpster Divers uh, Facebook page. And take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.